I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you to just, just let it go. But my, you've noticed before it's when there's AC going and fans blowing and stuff, my eyes water. You sure you're not sleepy cry or you got to cry? Something like yeah, that. so that's what I'm saying. Don't tell me I'm crying. I'm not crying. It ha- I mean, if it's winter time. Why are you winking at me as you say this? <laughs> For the audio listener, he's winking at me. If it's not winter time, no. Like not, you mean like right now? If it's winter time in a cold locale, uh huh. It's just I just stop wiping tears away. It's like it's you just let it flow. The wind's blowing. Doesn't it's there's no reason. You just to let it. people know that you are a man goes, who's comfortable in his emotions, in his own skin. No, if they ask, I say. It's the wind. I'm, I don't cry. That's what I say whenever I cry. It's the wind. I'm not crying. Actually, that's not true. I just let it flow. Do you? Yeah, of course. I tell you about that time that I was crying on the street in uh, New York and I asked a lady for a hug and she did not. She just ignored me. Uh, why did you? Because I, I was just in a bad place and I was, I was like, damn, I need a fucking hug from anyone. And there was like nobody around. Dude. And I was just crying and she, this woman walked, she looked like she was in her fifties. And I thought, okay, surely this lady will, will give me a hug. And I just was like, hey, excuse me. I know this is really weird. I would never touch you. I got I need a, I, I just need a hug. And she just looked at me and just kept on walking. I was like, okay. <laughs> and then. I mean, that's what you do in New York. If someone's well, asking yeah. you say, oh, I'm okay. Yeah, I but then anybody. this fucking black guy, also probably in his fifties is walking by. And I did it to him and he goes, sure, young man. And he gave me a hug and it was great. And I was laughing with him. I was like, thanks, dude. I just needed some human connection. <laughs> and and that it was it. awesome. Yeah. And then we kissed. And then uh, I went on my merry way. I was healed. I was healed. Were you really? No. But then I, you know, I was, I was better. It was, it was great. It Can was, you give me a neighborhood on this? Uh, neighborhood yeah, it was Williamsburg, to... man. Williamsburg. Yeah. Circa like 2016. It was a little later than that, but yeah. Like 2017. 20. Trump's America. What, what, what difference Williams does it make? It's the same Williams. I'm trying part. to think of, I'm trying to have context for the crying. Mm. That's what it's called when I send a text message. It's a context. Because my last name is yeah, Con. Yeah, no, I anyway, we got a banger of an episode for you guys today. We have a very special episode. Um, why don't you tell them, tell them why, why well, so we're covering look, people this? Have, uh, people have probably been seeing sovereign wealth funds in the news a all, lot lately. All the time. They, they are snatching up all your favorite sports stars. They're, they're, trying to, they're trying to buy into your leagues. They might have bought your, your favorite league. And so we wanted to... We've been covering some of it, and we're like, what the fuck even is a sovereign wealth fund? I think a lot of people don't even know. They, they probably hear about it in the news, but they don't actually know what it is. Mm. We wanted to talk about what it is, but then we kept pulling on the thread. and Boy, that, did that sweater unravel. Truly. I kind of became uh, the Charlie from It's Always Sunny meme, just with the, the fucking different threads, threads leading to things on the oh, cork yeah. board. Yeah. Um, and it's all connected to... It's all, it's all connected, man. To uh, Biden and Ukraine. No, it's no, not. No, what? I, I, I'm just... I'm, I'm cosplaying <clears throat> as, a, as a Fox News but correspondent. But so it, it goes much deeper than just possibly ruining your, your favorite sports team. It's, um, it could be making your life a whole lot worse. Yeah, that's true. So and I, contributing I, to just the financialization of everything. It's, right. uh, it's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, we got to <laughs> subscribe to... Every fucking thing, including and especially this YouTube channel. If you haven't already, you got to hit that button. And oh, also, hit the button. You got to hit that, uh, that notification bell so that you get interrupted with whatever it is you're doing. It'll give you the signal to drop whatever that might be, whether it's driving an ambulance. We want you to get a notification while you're in a meeting with your boss. And yeah. you say, sh- 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 shut the fuck up. I got to go. I got to watch episode. the new episode. But so, oh, and if you're on Spotify, please rate us five stars. We yeah, are, all of that. course, trying to it. juice those numbers. So you might be sitting there asking yourself, Ben, Emil, Emil, Ben. Yeah. Oh. What is a sovereign wealth fund? Well, let's pick it apart, shall we? Sovereign, sovereignty. You're you're a, you're a nation. You've got a bunch of money, and so you're going to put that wealth to work. Right, right. It's a it's a way for countries to invest their excess capital into uh, into other investments. Right? right. It's a state owned pool of money invested into financial assets. Makes sense. Right, 
But how is this different from a, you know, just a, just a principal investor, regular private equity? Well, I think your quote from Matt Taibbi, pretty good. Here. Right, right. So, well, there was also two very good, if you want to check them out, there are two very good books that I was reading that touched on some of these things. One was Matt Taibbi's book, Griftopia. He's got a whole chapter on sovereign wealth funds. And then another one was The Privatization of Everything, um, if you guys want to check those out. But in Matt Taibbi's Griftopia, he had a... Uh, he described them as a giant state-owned pile of money that swims around the world in search of things to buy. But mm. imagine the biggest and most aggressive hedge fund on Wall Street. Then imagine that that same fund is 50 or 60 times bigger and outside the reach of the SEC or any other major regulatory authority. And you've got a pretty good idea of what an what a sovereign wealth fund is. Ah, babu. Yeah. Currently... Uh the assets under management of the largest funds represent as much as twice the GDP of their respective countries. That's effing huge. And then, uh, do you know who the, you probably know, the biggest sovereign wealth fund? That would be Norway. That would be Norway. The Norges Bank Investment Management uh, Firm, <clears throat> which is currently just above $1.3 trillion in size. The next... China Investment Corporation at 1.2. And then you've got the Kuwait Investment Authority, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Government of Singapore, Temasek, National, Secu National Council for Security, Social Security Fund, the Public Investment Fund, which is a big one that we'll be talking about, Qatar, and it rounds it out with Dubai, Turkey, more China. So a lot of... Um, Right, a lot of people, um, Middle East and Asian. A lot of countries. people associate it with Middle East, but mm -hmm. and so it's surprising. Norway's is the biggest fund. Um, you know, these funds started. The first one was it was in the fifties, and it was the sovereign wealth fund. Um, Kuwait. Kuwait, yes, the Kuwait Investment Authority, authority using um, it to invest <clears throat> excess oil revenues, and then after that, it was Kiribati. 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 Which is what. Because when I when I saw that I went, what I the bit, fuck is Kiribati? I was a bit surprised they got in the game so early as well. A small, Kiribati, a small the small island, island, nation. island nation of Kiribati, which is <laughs> what do they fucking what do they have to invest? It is uh, yeah, I'm a bit curious what what kind of moves they're making. Yeah, if we I got any if we got any listeners or viewers from the island nation of Kiribati, yeah, please, please please let us know if we should be looking deeper into Kiribati. Sound off in the comments. Fund. But then. <clears throat> Starting in the 70s, you started to see some of these really big players. Uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, that, sh that popped up in 1976. Singapore's Government Investment Corporation, 1981. And then uh, Norway's Government Pension Fund in 1990. Uh, and <clears throat> these things, they've been growing exponentially, right? Mm -hmm. So two decades ago, sovereign wealth funds, they held barely $1 trillion in assets. But that has grown more than 11-fold to $11.36 trillion at year-end 2022. That's from the Journal of International Business Policy. Um, and they really started taking off in 2004, 2005, when the price of oil started to push above $40 a barrel. Right, so there's a recurring and then theme just here. Yes. Skyrocketed after right. that. There, there, there's a, a connection to be drawn between uh, natural resources and the skyrocketing, like oil, and there's, it's no coincidence that some of the top 10 funds are... Are Middle East right countries countries in the Middle East that that benefit from having a and ton. you don't want to just sit on all that excess revenue right what are you gonna do with just a bunch of cash right so, so it's also important to note that sovereign wealth funds are you know unlike banks they're not subject to any supranational regulations they're merely required to follow the laws and regulations of their respective countries of origin. And these can be these can vary greatly in terms of de of their depth and rigor. Okay, so they're not. They're not following the same standards as uh, whatever countries they're operating in. They're, you know, following them in, in their home countries. Mm -hmm. um, how else are they different? So there, there's, I mean, we, we touched on how they're bigger, orders of magnitude bigger in some cases than, than your standard hedge fund or pension fund. Um, and by the way, so like the United States doesn't have a sovereign wealth fund. There's been talks about, Creating one because we also have, I mean, we're a totally indebted nation, but we also do produce a ton of oil, for example. And there are natural resources that we exploit that the country could profit from and then invest the profits of. That's not to say that each individual state cannot and does not have sovereign wealth funds 
For example, Alaska has its own sort of sovereign wealth fund that it puts to use. But anyway, yeah, we should get Alaska to start buying up some uh, maybe English soccer teams. Uh, I'm talking. I, I want an Italian basketball team. No, 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 no. You're thinking too. You're thinking too too far, my man. I'm thinking we got to convince one of these oil barons that podcasts and Ooh, media are the way is... to go. I would suck off Mohammed bin Salman or whatever his <laughs> name is to get some of that sweet sweet oil money. Look, this is a this is a specific. T- Specifically to MBS's nephew who may be watching. So hot. <laughs> so hot, this guy. Please, if you're interested, maybe tell your uncle, you know, we need an injection of cash. I don't even uh, think he needs to consult with the uncle. I think he's, we don't need that much. We need like $100 million. Yeah, don't even consult with the uncle. You probably got, you probably got some walking around money yeah. we could use. So they differ in, in basically four key ways from, from other investors in other funds. First of all, obviously they're government backed. Um, They typically don't, because they're government backed. Secondly, they don't need a lot of liquidity. They don't need a lot of cash because they've got some pretty stable sources of funding. They're coming from the coffers of, of whether it's the natural resources or whatever industry the country is, is working with. Um, So they can obviously put together a huge pool of that liquidity to have stable capital at the ready to deploy whenever they want. So third and and kind of relating to that is they have way longer investment horizons, horizons than your typical hedge fund whose time horizon is somewhere around like five to seven years on average. Right. Norway, for example, 30 year investment investment window. window. Right. And uh, fourth, their risk tolerance is typically a lot higher in kind because their their investment horizon is so broad and long uh their risk tolerance is a lot higher so they're going to probably be able to withstand market fluctuations um more than your average hedge fund so because of that they they've got these they typically they have mandates these wealth funds they have their individual goals whether it can be to stabilize the domestic economy it can be used to uh, plug funding gaps for infrastructure, things like that. And also just to kind of um, buttress the country, the, the, the country of origins um, investment capital from cyclical things that might affect the way that they make money. For example, that would be like oil producing countries investing in electric vehicles. Right. Right. So there's a kind of symbiotic relationship between the country of origin where the, where the money is originating from, obviously with these sovereign wealth funds, and then the country where those funds are deployed. So we've already touched on how the country of origin benefits by diversifying their massive swaths of wealth because it, they're diversifying. It right. You're sense. not just making your money on oil anymore. Now you've got investments in all different types of assets, all different types of industries. Yeah, you know, it's beneficial uh, to, to, to the society, to your culture, to the people, to everything. And some of these investments could pay off hugely. That's right. As, as it has. I mean, mm-hmm. Oman is a great example. They established their portfolio and they've been, I think just in the last, uh, yeah, three years ago after it was launched, they reported last year uh, over $5 billion of, uh, of their, in their currency of, in dividends to state coffers, um, which they then deployed in, into new investments. But so it's beneficial to them, but it's also beneficial to the country that receives it. And the most obvious one is access to capital, access to liquidity that, that otherwise you might not be able to get, whether you're a company, whether you're a sports team, there are, there's an argument to be made for it improving price efficiency too, because you're you're adding that liquidity and you're increasing kind of competition between the sovereign wealth funds and the other funds that might be investing. Investing. So as we've uh, dove in more, we learned that it ain't all just sunshine and rainbows. There is a lot of money sloshing around and benefits the some. Com- yeah, benefits some of the countries whether they're receiving or giving the the money. But uh, we learned that these funds aren't just buying stakes in public companies, right, Emil? Why are these foreign countries buying up athletes and sports teams? What, are they know. building an army? I hope so. That an army of Ronaldos? Cool. 
to kick soccer balls at our heads? What are they up to? What else are they buying? And why are they going to make our shitty lives even shittier? I'd like to try to sell something to you. Oh man, so oof. I I think that if if we're gonna start diving into this, we should probably talk about the most controversial of all these sovereign wealth funds. The which one is, people have probably been hearing about right. the most is uh, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. What the fuck is the Saudi PIF. Arabia's public investment fund? Right? They got more than seven hundred billion dollars in a lot? Saudi is government that good? money. I'm pretty sure 700 billion American is a lot of that's almost uh, that's close to the entire defense budget. Right up there, man. Sounds pretty good. God bless. God bless the Saudi Public Investment Fund. That's right. So they've got they're they're spread out all over the place. They were established in 1971 as we said by royal decree. They're headquartered in Riyadh. They've got offices in Hong Kong, London, New York. And they've been growing rapidly in recent years. That's exactly right. <clears throat> trying to fund ambitious tourism, commercial undertakings it calls giga projects. Okay, these giga projects are fucking insane. You love giga projects. I actually really, I go You're gaga. You're trying to get your own giga project. No, I, I'm saying I go gaga for giga projects. Gaga for giga. Yeah. I would like, they're, they're insane. They're basically, think of, think of what a 10-year-old with a great imagination would invent for like, hey, 10 year old, come up with a super city in the desert. Okay, I want it to have a water slide. And it's all one line. Yeah, it's, and it's mirrored. Yeah, no, no, that's just one of them. You're talking about the, the line yeah, city. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm talking about so much more than that. They've got, <laughs> they've got this one called Kidia, oh, which dude. is a multi billion dollar, just, it's just like an entertainment city. They want it to be bigger than Walt Disney World. They, and so <laughs> do we, honestly. They want theme parks, water parks. My favorite one, though, is called The Rig, where they just, they just it's an oil rig theme park. Fuck yes. <laughs> where they take. Can we invest in the Saudi, the public investment fund? Because I want this thing. I want to fuck around with The Rig. And I mean, this is the only photo we've got of it. Just imagine if you took a giant oil rig and like built a swimming pool on top of it and like. Water slides, that's the rig. It. It's, uh, Is there a Boston cop barreling down the water slide too <laughs> fast? <laughs> so <laughs> these giga projects are very ambitious ways for, for Saudi Arabia to just piss away money and build giant super cities in the middle of the most inhospitable climate on the planet, increasingly inhospitable climate on the planet, the fucking desert. Right, but it's not... They're not pissing this away. They've got a vision, right? So this fund is led by, the, its governor is called, uh, yeah, excuse the pronunciations on some of these names. I am sorry. I'm doing my best. Inshallah, we will pronounce <laughs> these names right. Yasir al-Rumayan. He's a, he was a, you think that was good? That was good. Okay. He's a banker, um, former chairman of Saudi Aramco. Um, <clears throat> and, but people are saying the real powerhouse behind this fund, none other than Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, but he's got he's got a vision, Vision 2030, right? They're trying to wean Saudi Arabia off its dependency on its petrol wealth and expand its economy into technology, healthcare, and other areas. I think they can do it. You think, think they can, they do, can it? do it? Yeah. And so to do that, they through want the to, power of golf. They want to create private sector jobs for the kingdom's large youth population while allowing new liberties for women. Uh, and so he set a goal of growing the public investment fund's assets to three trillion dollars. By 2030. Man, I got to get some of that oil money. You know, I got a buddy who's an architect. I would do anything for some oil money. <laughs> True story. Did you hear about that house here in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills that that kid who just won the Mega Millions billion dollars or whatever bought? No. It's like a $50 million home. My friend helped design it. 
it, it was the house that came with like 10 cars. You could, you could get like 10 cars. The with house it. that came with 10 cars. But, but it was funded by this, Ira- I believe he was Iraqi and he used to fuck with. Which Rocky? What Iraqi. Oh, Iraqi. Oh, oh. No, yeah, I know what you're thinking. No, not, not that Rocky. You know me. I think of a small Italian man from Philadelphia yeah. putting the whole city on no, his back. No, 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 no. This is Iraqi. Like Saddam Hussein. Oh, okay. I believe it. he used to be Saddam Hussein's bodyguard or something. And long story short, the man has so much money, he doesn't know what to do with it. So he literally just kind of gets bored and goes, I think I'll hire an architect and, and build a mansion in uh, Los Angeles because I think it's fun. It's fun for him. Hey, God bless you, buddy. I think they listed it for like $60 million, $60 million and nobody was biting. So then they, instead of lowering it to like 50 or 40, they just cut it in half. Uh, actually, instead of 60, we'll do 30. And then this kid bought it and good for him. But so what has the PIF invested in? They've got. Right. How are they accomplishing? These Uber. Goals? They bought into Blackstone. They bought into SoftBank. They bought the uh, into the English Premier League and Newcastle United. Right. They, so that's the one that people are really hearing about is the sports. All right. They, right. they have a they have a big appetite for sports here. They've got their first investment was WWE. That's right. Uh, it's pretty cool if you ask me. 2018, when the Saudi sports ministry signed a 10 year contract to host world wrestling entertainment events, a deal worth a reported $100 million per year. That's right. 10% of the WWE's annual revenue. Yeah. And they Since gave. then, oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. Oh, they've been, they've been just on a tear. They, they gave a three year, $25 million contract to Messi. They, 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 no, they offered him one. He they did offered not, him he did one, not excuse take me. It. But the, Ronaldo, 600 million. Huge. The, and most recently, as we know, the, the PGA tour merging with LIV, which is mired in controversy because it was all of a sudden. Which that started with, you know, they launched their own. Right. Th- this, so these were investments into existing things such as, you know, horse racing, boxing, tennis, Formula One events. Was, was there some sort of catalyst that kicked all this off? This investing in sports? I, what Did something happen in 2018? Was someone assassinated, <laughs> perchance? Was right. a journalist killed and dismembered? Right, so Ben is alluding to the fact that uh, Saudi Arabia has been accused of maybe using, uh, using their Vision 2030 to have a vision for sports washing this Saudi Arabia's yeah, so people would take their vision <laughs> off yeah. of their myriad hey, why human don't you rights try violations. These glasses, ooh, yeah. sports. Well, I almost forgot about what you guys did to that uh, journalist, and also nine eleven. Yes, because they are. But Ben is talking about <laughs> Jamal Khashoggi, journalist yes. who a lot of people allege that MBS himself approved of uh, dismembering. <laughs> Killing well, and dismembering. Authorizing it. Yeah. They said it was, it was rogue government agents who did it, but. Right. So they ramped up these investments and it's not just that, right? There's uh, they have a history of human rights violations. Uh, look, as do we. Women right, couldn't drive until uh, very recently. Yes. Um, what did, what did Hillary Clinton say? Ladies, start your engines. Remember she tweeted that? Did she really? I think she did. I think when Saudi Arabia just gave women the right to drive, Hillary Clinton said, ladies, start your engines. I love her. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just a beautiful. I think she tweeted it. She didn't say it, but in my head, but she you said can it. picture her. Yeah, saying you can picture it, her saying that's all that matters. Um, but yeah, and look, the, the sports thing is not uh, limited to Saudi. That's, you know, in the past decade, smaller Gulf states have also made big sports investments, drawing controversy. Right. China hosting the Olympics was something to... Russia hosting the, the Winter Olympics after um, Emery, Emirati and Qatari royal families um, buying up professional soccer teams. Qatar hosted FIFA World Cup in 2010. it's pronounced Qatar. Is it really? I think. Okay, Qatar. Someone Qatar. correct me. I think. It's fine. This, is, this, this episode will be mired in... Mispronunciations. Yeah, because it's hard. It is hard, and we are stupid. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, they're seeking to you know they're trying to change the conversation about uh, about what people are saying when you when you think about these countries, right? What you want to be thinking? Hey, look, you it's a very thinking- similar playbook to you know what do all these what do all these big companies and families do in the U.S. Right? It's uh, what, remember what Sackler was doing. Hey, we don't want to be we don't want to be remembered for people dying on their own puke because they took too much Oxycontin. Jesus Christ. We want to be the art family. We yeah. want to be the fucking... Or Leon Black, the Epstein guy who, sure. who was fucking 
diddling kids. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm going to donate. Uh, I'm going to have a wing at the MoMA. Sure. But I think that, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, they, so these people are all trying to change the conversation around themselves. So, and, and, right. and these, these Middle Eastern countries are no different. And it freaks out a lot of, it freaks out a lot of uh, uh, senators and, and people in the government. So when it also the- freaks out some people, they, they've tried to invest with people and it's been given back. I think, uh, W WME yeah, was given $400 million. He, his brother is William Morris endeavor. Yeah, but I can't, uh, his brother's the mayor of Chicago, Emmanuel, um, Rahm Emanuel. Yeah. Rahm Emanuel. Well, you know, who didn't, you know who didn't have a problem taking Saudi Arabian money? A lot of people. Stephen Mnuchin, former United States yes. uh, Treasurer, Secretary of the Treasury, and uh, Jared Kushner. One Jared Kushner had no problem taking a few billion dollars or a few hundred million. Basically, both Mnuchin and Kushner, right after the Trump administration ended, took on some money for their own private equity firms. Good yeah, for them. WME I, returned $400 million. That's right, right after Khashoggi. Um, and and so there's not a whole lot that can be done, right? Because they're not really breaking any laws by investing in these things. So uh, Senator Richard Blumenthal, who was leading a probe on the PGA Tour and LIV golf merger, um, he basically was just saying that the hearings were just about how, a quote, a brutal repressing regime, repressive regime can buy influence indeed even take over a cherished american institution simply to cleanse its public image bitch that's your capitalism at work you don't want it to happen put some laws on the books i don't know what to tell you man yeah it's fucked up it's actually a you know a cosmic joke that the same it, it would only be more sweet if saudi arabia the the country that famously now funded the 9-11 attackers, uh, if they bought a stake in Major League Baseball or Apple Pie or something like that. Or if they bought a stake in the uh, Freedom Tower. Oh, yes, yeah, some shit one like world, that. One oh, world. my God. It, it's basically <laughs> akin to that. Jesus H. Christ. Which, honestly, do it. It would be funny. <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's all sorts of problems, right? Because... They're, they're accused of sport washing, but also at the same time, we're a progressive society. We believe that these, uh, that people can change, countries can change. And if you're Muhammad, if you're MBS, you're thinking, can you guys just like forget about it? And can we move on? Can we get past it? Look, we know we gave women the right to drive. We fucked up killing Jamal Khashoggi. We and fucked sure up we with locked 9/11. up some of the, the protesters who were protesting to get the ability to yeah, drive. The but dissidents. that's behind us now. Yeah. Well, you know what's in front of us? Vision 2030. And that includes a fucking brand new golf tour, baby. Yeah, we love the golf tour. That's probably uh, the biggest one that people have been hearing about right now, right? It started <clears throat> It started previously when first it was just live and they were luring all of our biggest stars away, most notably Phil Mickelson, yeah. with a $200 million payout become the front men of this... Uh, Jesus Christ. This new league. And people were, people were like, they were pissed at people who were taking these payouts, right? Biggest, the bigger stars like Tiger Woods had harsh words for the new league and for Greg Norman, who became the Western face of Liv as its commissioner. With Liv poaching some of its most widely known players from the established PGA Tour, the PGA banished them. And then, I love this, we don't know exactly how the merger happened. In, a hush-hush, in hush-hush meetings, presumably sweetened by promised riches. That's right. God, I love those promised riches. Oh man, I would kill for some promised riches. But then and these people in Saudi Arabia were stoked. There's this guy, uh, uh, Prince Talal Al Faisal, said, "I'm not going to lie. This is a moment that a lot of us are relishing." Yeah, and I, I can't blame him. I mean, and also, it, it's funny because this whole thing being so soaked, steeped in controversy, really gives sovereign wealth funds a bad name. When the as we were looking, it's like, yeah, there's there's benefits to be had, but as we will see there are some major, major pitfalls. And again, it's kind of America uh, shooting ourselves in the foot when we, we fuck around and we do indeed find out. Yeah. Right? Well, it's also making a lot of people look bad. So for example, the, the PGA Tours commissioner was previously saying that it's, you know, it's never going to happen. No fucking these people, way, he said. These people are, they're, they're, they're scumbags. I can't believe they would leave for money, right? Mm-hmm. And then just, you know, promised riches, that whole thing. 
And then he, so he just said, I recognize that people are going to call me a hypocrite, but circumstances do change. He said, as he was falling over to, to carry his bags of money. Yeah. Look, circumstances change. Circumstances change, folks. Do you think that that's what happened? Do you think that they just offered him insane amounts of money? Yes, dude. I mean, I mean, as we'll get to some of these other sports stars, I mean, you're, you're ta- like, okay. And so look, that's the thing, right? A lot of these, a lot of these sports had rules in place that made sure these things didn't happen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but now those are changing. Uh, the NBA, for one, it was you weren't allowed to have uh, foreign governments, foreign funds buying into the league. Now, why did they? Why did they not want that? They why did want, they not want that? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I would imagine that like sport, sports fans have very. <clears throat> I'm not like a huge sports fan, so I'm, for I, I, I'm the I'm the worst person to comment on this, but I would imagine people feel very connected to their sports teams, whether it's like geographically and just, it's like an emotional thing for people. And I think it sucks when your sports team just becomes, you know, an asset on a balance sheet Mm -hmm. for people. And there are people who don't care about the thing. People want, um, people want owners of teams who they can trust. And they're like, they're going to lead us into a new era. George Steinbrenner. Remember everyone, everyone loved George Steinbrenner, the Yankees, he, he was Had, the boss. We, we could trust George Steinbrenner to do the right thing for the team. Yeah. So perhaps it was something, it was a, it was a sort of uh, fail safe against turning sports teams, transforming them from things that are, are beloved institutions and, and making them into something that is just another ass. Like you said at the top, it's just another way of, financial financialization of fucking everything right so nothing is holy anymore nothing is sacred not even our precious golden state warriors right and you're seeing that i mean well so okay so just not to get ahead of ourselves so the this was in december of 2022 the board of governors of of the nba basically made a rule change that allowed for sovereign wealth funds and other institutional funds to buy stakes in teams awesome um which is great for pretty much just the owner's and the athletes, because now you're probably going to see the value of your team rise huge. Right. Probably bad for fans. But so it's still limited under the new policy. A foreign fund can buy up to 20 percent of a team. They can't just uh, they can't just come in. And and this first started uh, when remember when the Brooklyn Nets was owned by that Russian man, Mikhail, uh, Mikhail, Mikhail Prokhorov. Prokhorov. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I want to buy Brooklyn Nets. You sell me. Yes. OK, we make deal. So they, they are allowing it, but they want to make sure they are restricted to like passive ownership. They can't just come in and like buy right. up the whole team, make all these changes, that kind of thing. Right. And, but yeah, you're seeing, you know, these, these teams and stuff are so astronomically priced that you're limiting the amount of buyers. If, if you want to change hands with these things, I mean, when you're talking They're a about- a very illiquid <laughs> asset. When you're talking about something that's worth $6 billion, $7 billion- you know, there's not a ton of people who are going to be who are going to be able to buy it. I mean, you're seeing with oh, what is the new name of the Washington Redskins? The Washington Generals. Generals. I think Jeff Bezos is looking into uh, buying up the team. It's a very small pool of people who can who can handle buying one of these teams. Um, and so it's already happening, right? So you had Qatar, uh, Cutter's Sovereign Wealth Fund purchased the five percent stake in Monumental Sports and Entertainment giving it stakes in the NBA's Washington Wizards, WNBA's Washington Mystics, and the NHL's Washington Capitals. That's surprising that they would buy into a WNBA team. Why? Because there's no, I mean, it, it, they've tried and tried and tried and tried. Oh, well, so, just, no, no, no. They didn't buy into these things individually. They bought into Monumental Sports uh, Entertainment, right, which, which has, is, it's, it's, it. it's like a conglomerate that owns these. Right. Yeah. I can't imagine that they think So that, it's already going to get confusing, right? One conglomerate owns it another giant fund is buying into that right their funds on top of funds right on top of it's funds all the way down and it's not just golf it's not just formula one it's not just the nba it's tennis now don't too. say it no i tennis. know it's probably the best candidate for a for a, a rival tour i know just that's like what they're you've saying got liv it's very similar it's gonna happen you don't have to deal with a bunch of teams and you can just entice players individuals who are, uh you can offer them massive amounts. Uh, you know, Greek Greek player Stefanos Tsitsipas already been playing in Saudi Arabia. We'll uh, we'll see. I mean, how do you fucking turn? That's the thing. They make these deals, 
where yeah. it's like, why the fuck not? Yeah, Ronaldo, I got $200, $200 million a year. They, they, yep. they offered Mbappé. Is that how you say it? Mbappé? I'm Mbappa? glad you said it. Mbappé. Mbappé. <laughs> someone, someone is screaming at us. This is one of like the most Saudi famous. Arabia, the Saudi, they, the Saudi club Al-Hilal uh, proposed a world record $332 million transfer fee to bring over uh, Mbappé from Paris Saint-Germain. Plus, they'd pay him a one-year salary worth Seven hundred and seventy-six million dollars. <laughs> these guys. These are like mine. This is what's funny about these guys. They they seem to have so much money. They don't have a concept of how much money is worth anymore. Well, that's the thing. Is no one going like, well, surely we could entice him with I don't know four hundred million. Yeah, let's start at like, no, no, no. Let's start at twenty percent more than what he made last year. They're they're naming numbers. How that- about seven hundred seventy-six <laughs> million dollars, sir, to start? They're doing numbers that if they were to just go to him and be like, "We'll pay you whatever, he, whatever you want," he'd be like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna make like a crazy yeah, two hundred like, million dollars." <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, <laughs> you yeah. rip up the check for three times as much." <laughs> Jesus H, God, right? Oh and my someone, god. someone had uh, from front office sports like they people have been breaking down what, how ridiculous these offers are, right? For so for this one year, one year salary. There, that's more than LeBron James's all-time NBA earnings, which is five hundred thirty-one million dollars. Right. It's more than Patrick Mahone, Mahomes' deal through third. Wait, what did you call him, Mahomes? I don't think it's Mahomes, dude. <laughs> I think it's Mahomes. It? I'm not a I'll take it from guy. here. The entire value of the Arizona Coyotes, <laughs> the entire value of the New York Mets' entire payroll. You guys get the gist. Tom Brady's entire NFL entire earnings. Entire NFL These are earnings. Just insane, copious amounts of oil money. But so, okay. Enough about sports. We get it. You guys did 9-11. You guys, uh, you, you cut up Jamal Khashoggi. You didn't let women drive. You're, you've got a bad record on human rights. And what's the best way to probably get rid of, to, to paint yourselves in a new light? Show, show up and go, hey, buddy, hello, I'm a fellow sports lover. I would like to invest in some sports and, and bring, uh, bring us into the national stage and fund these ambitious projects. We've got to invest our money somewhere. We've got a plan for the future. You're getting but, people's eyeballs. People are, you're boosting tourism. Yeah, you're doing everything. And it's like, okay, I get it. We're not going to, you're not going to just be isolated from the world. But you know what I surely, did watch in preparation, in preparation for this? What? Sex in the City too. Oh yeah. How they went to Dubai? They go to Abu, Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Damn, dude. It they, is very funny. It feels like a commercial. They for, probably took a payout for I, sure. I, it's, I honestly think it might've been some investment. Of course it was. In, Absolutely it was. It's like the whole they could throw a hundred million dollars at that and be like, bring, bring me the sex in the city women, <laughs> bring them to me. It's, it's <laughs> and very, they were there. Yeah, I'm like, Sarah Jessica Parker and her horse face shows up and goes, yeah, I'm here. it's like a whole, uh, listen, you put a sugar cube in front of me. I'm going to, I'm going to lap it up. Yeah. Just a, just a complete ad for Abu yeah. Dhabi tourism. But so it, it, it's, it's one of those things where on the on the face of it, it, it feels nefarious, but then you're like, well, I guess they're not really doing anything wrong. Wrong. They also do some sketchy things. They do some 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 uh, some really sketchy things, in fact. And we we can point to the city of Chicago. The so this city is of, the one that really fucked me up. Yeah, because uh, you love Chicago. You love you famously. You love Chicago's Chicago's parking meters. No, no, no. Right? What do I really love is I love public goods. Yes, yeah, you I'm do. an absolute freak for this. He stuff. is an absolute and <clears throat> freak. That's kind of how a lot of this started. Was I was reading the I was reading the book, the privatization of everything, and they they tell this story about how the Chicago parking meters got sold off to private equity, which eventually ended up with an ownership stake from a sovereign wealth fund. And I honestly could not believe it. I started. I was like, why have I not fucking heard of this? Started looking into other things. That's when someone recommended me Matt Taibbi's book because they were like, oh, there's a chapter in it about that. Right. Uh, the story's fucking wild. So basically, it starts around the housing crisis. You got energy prices right. Early skyrocketing. 2000s. You got people tightening their belts. State municipal executives start to put their infrastructure assets up for sale because everything is for sale well, these days. For to, lease, for lease, up excuse to lease, me. But it, it essentially ends up becoming like a sale because they're proposing these things for 75 years, 99 years. Standard issue stuff, standard contracts. You want to buy in 75 years because we'll all be dead and won't have to answer for anything in that time anyway. And so the Chicago parking meter is not the only one of these that happens. It's just the most 
insane. egregious example of something like this, yeah. right? And it's it's best if we just go through a timeline of just how fucked up this this happened, right? So in 2008, we all remember what a glorious time that was for it us. It was awesome. I mean, that's what's it's funny. nothing bad. There's happened. a there's a very funny line in Sex in the City. They all it's 2010. They're all complaining at some you know lovely restaurant, and uh, Samantha gets this opportunity to go to Abu Dhabi, and she wants to bring the girls, and they're all like, Abu Dhabi? Are we going to fly to Abu Dhabi? And she's like, enough, you're coming. I'm sick of this shitty economy and this shitty blah, blah, blah. And they're like, we're fleeing this for it to be around wealth again. Um, anyway, so we were all having a tough time. Yes, uh, but not the gals. But not as hard as, the, uh, as those gals who really deserved a vacation in Abu Dhabi. All right, so uh, they've got plummeting revenues throughout the city. No end in sight. And then a group of private investors led by Morgan Stanley came in with $1.16 billion. And all Chicago had to do was give up control to its 36,000 parking meters. 36 fucking thousand And look, meters. they were in need of modernization anyway, right? So for 75 years, they get a huge cash invest, uh, injection, right? And so it seemed like a decision was made without public involvement or much scrutiny of this contract, this right. major contract, right? And it's like all of a sudden, cool. Now Morgan Stanley's taken over for 75 years, all 36,000 of these parking meters. Surely there's going to be no strings attached. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so <clears throat> Matt Taibbi ends up talking to some of these aldermen who voted no on this What is project. an alderman? And all, it's, a, it's a city council member. Right. Um, so... Sh uh, Chicago city council members or aldermen had to vote on this proposal to make it go through. And so one of them, Ray Colon from the, from the 35th was in, he says, I was in my office. Wait, on wait, wait. I got to do his voice. Cause we got to, we got to put some color on this. Oh, you man. got a Chicago stank yeah. for me. I was in my office on a, wait, how does a fucking Chicago, Chicago. Oh, I was yeah, in my is. office on a Monday when I got a call that there was going to be a special meeting of the finance committee. I didn't know what it was about this happened the, oh wait that's not part of it so quote. this was on this is just this is just this I happened i didn't know what it was about this happened on december 1st 2008 yeah. okay so if you're keeping track he gets a uh, call and this this becomes the first time that the city council was even notified from mayor richard daly december that they, 1st that they were in they were they were doing this deal with morgan stanley to at least the chicago yeah leaders. okay and basically by by december 4th three days later the finance committee meets, they review the deal, and 10 minutes into the meeting, some of the aldermen begin to protest. They're going, hey, we haven't seen copies of this agreement. What are you guys thinking? What's going on here? So they put together a bunch of copies really fast, a short uh, little document giving like no details. And uh, uh, so here's alderman um, Robert Fioretti. Or Rush well, I'm just going to do the same fucking voice. Should I? Sure. Hey, we're rushing through this thing. Why? We've been working on this for the better part of a year, so we haven't been hasty. You had a year, but you're giving us two days, says Alderman Ike Carruthers. His name is Ike Carruthers. <laughs> they've, they're basically, they've been talking about this deal for like a year, but then they're just right. pushing it through. This is from the Chicago Reader. Inexplicably. They're, they're, they've been watching, you know, reporting on this deal going through. Yes. And so now, <clears throat> yeah, they're pissed because these guys who were part of the deal was saying, well, no, we've been putting this together for a deal. We know what we're doing. Get out of our way. Uh, and so the, the chief financial officer, um, Paul Volpe, says that the reason the deal has to be rushed is that a sudden change in interest rates mm. could cost the city later on. Oh, that makes mm. sense. we got to rush this fucking thing. But. A lot of people are wondering if maybe maybe Volpe has no business being a chief financial officer because at this time, uh, you know, we're in the wake of a financial crash, right? Interest rates are at rock bottom, mm -hmm. meaning the, the city stood only to lose money by hurrying. Higher interest rates would have allowed them to use the interest on the lump payment to fill their budget gaps rather than the principal of the payment itself. Okay? What ends up happening? The it measure passes. passes 40 to five. Yeah. Interesting. How and the none, of the, none of the aldermen who voted yes on the deal responded to Matt Taibbi when he reached out to uh, try to speak to them. Interesting. Because it all got fucked. Right. And so, again, what, is, what does this have to do with sovereign wealth funds, right? Because all we know at this point 
is Morgan Stanley's infrastructure desk, Morgan Stanley's infrastructure fund, put this all together, right? They were the face of the deal. They were raising a ton of money to get this deal done. And they're going around asking people with buttloads of money to invest. Yeah. And who has buttloads of money? Abu Dhabi does. The <laughs> Abu Dhabi Investment Authority specifically has buttloads of money. So they ask, they, they put their presentation up to... Um, so, to Morgan, so let's recap. Morgan Stanley now owns, for $1.16 billion, a 75-year contract to own 36,000 parking meters in Chicago. They now got it. And now they're going around and trying to pimp it out. They're trying to flip it. Before they even do that, they're, they're trying to put the funds together. They're not funding this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. they're, so they're getting people, they're, they're trying to get investors in the original deal, all right? So at right. first, it's Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Partners. They've got, they've got Teacher Retirement System of Texas, another fund. They've got Victorian Funds Manage Corp Management Corporation of Australia. They got Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group. Right. So they got all kinds of funds yes. helping to put this deal together, right? They put together the uh, $1.6 billion needed to win the bid. All right. And so, <clears throat> and at that point they did, they took the pitch to the um, Abu Dhabi investment. And they owned about 6%. Right. They, they were like, we're good for a 6% stake. We like this whole parking meter scheme you got going in. We love it. People got to park somewhere. They got to park somewhere. Right. So, so they put, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened. Oh, you can keep that. That's funny. So everything's looking all good. Sort of. When two months later, Morgan Stanley wants to uh, reduce their exposure, they want to divest a little bit, and they seek out a minority investor, D-Side Investments, to accept 49.9% stake Sounds ownership. Sounds good to me, right? Why not? Yeah, but who owns D-Side Investments? Tanadice Investments. Okay, that, that sounds fine. What's Who owns Tanadice Investments, you ask? <laughs> oh, the Abu Dhabi, the Abu Dhabi Investment, Investment Authority. Authority. So basically, they found a, Morgan Stanley found a bunch of investors, including themselves. Then they bailed out to make way for foreign-owned investment groups. So now Chicago just got screwed. <laughs> their, their, their parking meters take in $138.7 million a year. In 2019, that's how much they took in. So all told, private investors have earned $1.6 billion so far. That's $500 million more than their initial $1.16 right. billion dollar investment. So they got absolutely fucked. Yeah. With 60 years worth of right. parking meter so revenue. So they've already made back their investment. Yes. And they've got 60 more fucking years. Oh my God. Okay? So then Chicago's inspector general later finds out that the city stood to lose nearly a billion dollars over the course of the contract by taking a billion dollars up front. But that massive revenue shortfall was only part of what Chicago lost because when investors got control over the meters, they also gained control over public space and even future development. Who the fuck put this deal together? Morgan Stanley, baby. Oh, baby. Morgan Stanley and Infrastructure Fund. Oh, my God. God uh, bless. So when the investors put the contract together, they insisted that Chicago, quote, true up any loss caused by the city's changing with the times. So basically, hey, also... We're not only fucking you here, but if anything changes, you're going to have to fucking pay up, which is because because things change, right? You got uh, if a bus lane or a bike lane or a housing development or a street fair or tree planning or any other initiative is, is perceived is even just perceived to reduce parking revenue. The city must pay. Right. So these are called compensation events, right? So anytime one of these happens, it kicks in. OK, uh, so Events include street fairs, removals for improvements, temporary closures for parking lanes, ro road work. Morgan Stanley has been merciless in squeezing the city for alleged loss of revenue. They won $60 million in a court battle over closed streets. It didn't end there. Compensation, event, compensation events totaled $21.7 million in 2017 and $20 million in 2018. Concerns over triggering a compensation event now factor into every effort to alleviate traffic, or introduce new and cleaner modes of transit. The contract God has an damn. outside role in driving policy to reduce pollution and greenhouse gases, among other things. Oh my God. Often at oh odds Jesus with what is best for the city. So, so Chicago apparently had a vision for, they had their own kind of 2030 yeah, we had thing, but it was 2030 vision. But it was way more modest, right? It was, it was for 20 bus rapid transit lines. They're attractive and expensive options for, for uh, congested streets, but they involve closing the curb lane. And after the parking meter deal went into effect, the city had to either provide Morgan Stanley with new meters in a new location when it introduced a BRT, 
or pay for lost revenue for the life of the lease. So basically, the city of Chicago fucked themselves for all sorts of long-term plans. They had plans for 645 bike lanes and cycle tracks uh, uh, by 2020, but these didn't involve moving parking meters, removing parking spaces at the end of the block for a longer turn lane, and taking some uh, parking offline for construction. So now they're tied up in red tape. It's just... I mean, even... And just so small things too, right? They talk about even just like changing schedules of parking. Uh, You know, so for example, when the new ownership told Alderman Scott Wiggs back that it wanted to change the meter schedule from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Saturday to 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week, the alderman balked and said he'd rather keep the old schedule, at least for 270 of his meters. Chicago parking meters then informed him that if he wanted to do that, he would have to pay the company $608,000 over three years. So really beautiful stuff. So obviously, uh, who, who's at fault here? A lot of people, right? You got Morgan Stanley offering them a criminally bad deal. And then Chicago for green lighting and approving and signing a criminally bad deal, well, which yeah, and is so like criminally negligent. It's unclear what happened exactly, right? When, when we course. were talking about this, you were like, why would Chicago ever agree to this, right? And, and they pretty overwhelmingly agreed to it, oh right? We're talking God. about 40 to 5 vote. And I mean, they didn't want to, the, the aldermen who voted yes did not want to talk about why yeah, they probably voted yes. They're... Right. And so I was saying, I'm, we're left to speculate on why someone would vote that way, but it does seem like these funds were willing to throw around pretty large amounts of money. I, I, I actually don't a, even think it's that nefarious. I don't think that these aldermen took bribes is what you're saying, because if they knew the extent to how much they'd be uh, fucking over the city of Chicago, they would, I, I mean, if I, I don't think if understood. you were to offer me a, a bribe to fuck over the city of Los Angeles, first of all, I would do it. Because fuck the city of Los Angeles it's for so many reasons. To, it's also hard to fuck this city over. Anyway. Oh, yeah. They, they, this city is so fucked that they would make it difficult even for you to fuck it over. Right. Like It would somehow end up improving it. Yes. It would, no, and not even improving it. It would somehow benefit them. They'd be like, well, you tried to fuck us, but we got more revenue somehow that we're going to fucking waste on other shit. But like, what if, if you knew that you were going to be costing the city of Chicago bill, billions of dollars, how much would it take to buy your soul? I mean, we've talked about this before. It's it's always laughably they're they're laughably low numbers when you look at <clears throat> the reasons senators vote, the 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 funds they're taking from and stuff True. like that. You're like, Jesus Christ! To he took twenty thousand <laughs> dollars right, from GM to make it so you know kids are allowed to buy guns or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, but <clears throat> but again, it, it, you're right. It doesn't have to be that nefarious. It, it for some of these people, it could be as simple as as. Morgan Stanley infrastructure fund coming in and saying, look, we're the grownups in the room. You guys have a serious cash flow problem. Your revenues are fucking bottoming out. What are you going to do? It needs to be, it needs to be updated. We're the pros. Listen yeah. to us and we'll get you guys out of this fucking jam. Oh, and everyone's going, yeah, what the fuck? We're going to get $1.16 billion. Are you kidding me? Let's somebody, just listen to him. Somebody should kneecap these people. Someone should go Nancy Kerrigan style. So I, it, you know, but it doesn't have to be, but they're not the only ones, right? There's, there's, uh, there's this Brisa Auto Estradas, which is a Portuguese-based company, owns a contract to operate the Northwest Parkway in Denver, meaning they can tend to the road and profit to its terms for a term of nearly 99 years on their terms. And when residents wanted to improve a local road nearby, one that was still in public hands, the company objected. They pointed to contract language that barred localities from competing with the toll road, and it demanded compensation. They just said, right, hey, you want to fix too bad, your road? you can't do it, and you got to compensate you us. You want to fix your road? Pay us, yeah. bitch. And it's so, yeah, it goes on and on. Missoula, Montana, the Carlisle Group got in there, uh, buying up, carving up, and reselling small-town municipal waterworks. Bernhard awesome. Capital Partners went into Fayetteville, Louisiana with a deal to um, take over their water and power utilities. Look, $750 million, that's it. They years. requested a contract. We get to keep the profits. Yeah, we, we, they requested a contract to operate the city's water and power utilities for the next 30 years. Chicago, and keep the it was, and before all the Chicago parking meter stuff happened in 2004, the Chicago Parkway became the first major U.S. toll road to be privatized when Richard Daly again signed a $1.8 billion agreement for 99 Boy, year Chicago operational lease on the bridge. Up. And so on and on. Bayonne, New Jersey, Middletown, Pennsylvania for water and wastewater systems, selling, selling off to Suez and private equity, Colbert, Kravis Roberts. And <clears throat> look, this stuff, 
this, this has a huge impact on people. Uh, you know, studies show that customers of investor owned utilities pay 11% more on average than those served by public power, according to the American public power association. Uh, so, you know, we're in a place now where not only is it private equity, I mean, this has been going on forever. This, you know, people trying to privatize public goods. If you want to, there's a book, who is it? Oh my God. It's Dennis Kucinich did the division of light and power. He went to war in Ohio with trying to keep utilities public. Well, speaking of public utilities, a, a glaring example of, of how this shit can really just screw everything up and can, in many cases, cost lives is the Pacific Gas and Electric Company, PG&E in California. PG&E, baby. Made it uh, a for-profit entity that was publicly traded. And what happened? Well, when you got to worry about uh, costs and you got to worry about margins, you're not going to invest in things that you might consider superfluous. Like, for example, I don't know, updating woefully uh, dangerous and outdated power lines that ended up being the cause of wildfires that ended up uh, uh, in 28 and 29, 20, 20, 2018 and 2019, uh, when the De California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, CAL FIRE, blamed PG&E uh, for these major wildfires that claimed the lives of tons of people. Right. So now, you know. Because their shitty old power lines couldn't even withstand wind and then they fell down and, and caused fires. People died. So now when you have, you know, it's not just Wall Street who is who has forever been allergic to the bottom line and is not going to make the investments they need to. This is all just another asset for them. You now have this new player in sovereign wealth funds. And often oftentimes it's it's hard to even it's hard to even understand or know when they're even getting in on this action, right? You have to dig so deep to even find out what they've done to the Chicago parking meters, right? And so <clears throat> you can complain about like private equity, but now you have all these Sovereign wealth funds who are going to be buying it because look, the getting's good, right? Sign a fucking seventy-five year lease, make your money back in a few years, and then enjoy sixty years of just profits. Free money, in, people right? park in their cars. Fund your insane city in the desert. I want to. I mean, if it's if it gets us the oil rig theme park, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, if you're gonna, come, I want to jump off a. Of, uh, I want to jump off of a decommissioned. If you're gonna oil make it so I can't have into the a, Red Sea, if I can't have a street fair without paying hundreds of millions of dollars to a to a foreign fund, at least at least build us some kind of water park or something. Yeah, but, build us some kind but of build it far away. Yeah, well, no, it's gonna be offshore. It's gonna be about sixty miles offshore. Yeah, in <laughs> in fucking Abu Dhabi. No, yeah. it'll be offshore in the Pacific Ocean. Oh Jesus Christ! So uh, that brings us to. Why is this a problem? And I think at this point, it's probably glaringly obvious, right? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have companies. We shouldn't have, uh, we, first of all, we shouldn't have entertainment companies partnering with Saudi Arabia to wash away their, their controversies. We shouldn't have foreign countries owning huge parts of American infrastructure. We shouldn't have private equity owning public utilities and infrastructure, right? Yeah, and I think that, well, that's the funny part about it is that the sports thing has become so front facing for everyone. Yeah. And again, I'm not a huge sports person. So for me, that doesn't. Uh, I'm well, not you're really, only what? You're six feet tall. You're not. A, a great joke every time he does it. We, we can't get enough of it. Um, but. <laughs> But so like I don't I don't get all I don't get all weepy eyed about the the integrity of our, our team and what it means to the, the city. Steinbrenner putting our city on his back. But to some people that might feel shitty, right? It might feel shitty to have people getting shipped overseas and playing in these weird exhibition matches because they've been offered hundreds of millions of dollars. But there seems to be a much more nefarious plot underneath all this where you're like, Christ, these people will never have who are not who have to adhere to none of our regulations, answer to none of our regulators True. are going to be able to just affect our lives massively in ways that, which we'll never be able to fight back against. So obviously there's, there's a lot here. There's a lot that we've unpacked and there's, there's, you might be wondering, well, what's, what are we supposed to think about this? Well, that's, that's for you to decide first, but there is like, like a lot of things involving huge, massive swaths of money there's probably something to be said. There is something to be said for how regulation can can help mitigate some of the um, 
riskier, more dangerous things that we've obviously seen. So there's, that can happen. Um, because, look, sovereign wealth funds aren't going to go anywhere. No. There's, there's, no, there's no ability for the United States in particular to, to put an end to these things. And it wouldn't be in our best interest to just shut ourselves off from that kind of foreign investment because it, it would put us in a place where it, it's alienating, right? And also, it, there, it's, it's not really, in some cases, it's not that much different from just like private equity in, because in, there's nothing to stop foreign business people right, we're from not doing investing. A, we're not doing a great job of curbing private equity from taking over all these aspects right. of our life. The, and it's, it wouldn't do us any good to just say these things are all inherently bad. There are, that being said, there are, there exists a current sort of um, international agreement between over 30 of these funds have gotten together and they, they all kind of agreed to, it's voluntary. They put together these guidelines. They call them the Santiago Principle. Those will save us. Those will save us. But they're kind of, they're not a joke, but they're basically. They're a joke. They, they're kind of a joke in that there's no governing body, that there's no penalization if you don't follow these principles. There's no enforcement. There's, there, no, there's enforcement no enforcement mechanism. Because, because it's all just like. Every two years, you're voluntarily, you're, you're meant to, volu these countries are meant to voluntarily submit their own kind of self audit. Like. Hey, look, we took a look at what we were doing and we are following these rules that we've all... We want you to know we've been good this year. We've been good this year. But so regulations are important not only for protecting the, the countries that receive the nations, the corporations, and in some cases, the municipalities who receive these funds, but they can also benefit the country of origin too, in particular, the people who are meant to share in the profits from... Uh, their their nation's wealth. So there's a couple good examples I've got here. First of all, Libya. Muammar Gaddafi. The RIP the, to a real one. RIP to no, absolutely. RIP to a real one. You know how many subsidiaries the the Libyan sovereign wealth fund had? Tell me. Over 550. 550 different subsidiaries. Basically, everybody in that corrupt government was getting in and making sure that they had a way to just fucking milk the company or the milk the I country. I don't know if that's that out of the ordinary. I mean, I don't know how much, how many subsidiaries there, there are of these other companies, but I mean, just looking at the way, you know, the Chicago parking meter deal is stacked. It's like, and, oh, yeah. and, and the way, the way Morgan Stanley infrastructure fund chose to spin off a new LLC, Chicago parking meters, LLC, and then be using LAZ parking to manage. It's all a fucking. We love it. We it's love all a horrible puzzle of maze finance that. Yeah. They hope you don't dig into. You also had uh, the, there was um, the, there was a growth fund for Malaysia that was rife with, um, with corruption. The, it, it was meant to engage in their, their stated purpose was to engage in a variety of energy and real estate projects uh, often serving as a catalyst and partner for foreign investment. But surprise, the funds flowed into personal accounts controlled by, um, controlled by uh, Najib Razak, who was the financing prime minister. Um, and according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, the, the fund received a loan from Petro Saudi as part of an, a joint venture arrangement and then set up a loan repayment program for the fund to pay back the loan but payments of $700 million, $160 million, and $300 million were made to a company called Good Star Limited, controlled by an associate of the prime minister. So not good shit. Another use case of, of, uh, of this kind of governance and rules and stuff is one that I didn't really think of, but it's to protect countries and the people from when they get too much cash, when things work too well. So like hate, hate when things are working too well. Hate when I have too much cash. We got this right here. Equator Equatorial Guinea. Uh, What'd you call me? <laughs> no, say it, say it again. <laughs> so <laughs> Equatorial Guinea started large scale production of its hydrocarbon resources in 1996. And a large majority of the government's revenues were, are derived from these resources. Uh, but their governance structures were not equipped to handle the flow of these huge amounts of new wealth. 
uh, into its governmental uh, finance structure. So it was like they, they liken it in this article to attaching a garden hose to a fire hydrant. Fire hydrant. Just all this money coming in, and they did not know. They were advised. They ended up finally in 2002 creating uh, the Fund for Future Generations, the FFG, to, uh, to handle all these huge swaths of money. Um, it's just, it's a fucking mess, man. But a good example of one that does it well is the, is the, is the fund that Norway's got, the biggest one. Not only because they have the structure and they have the wherewithal to do it um, like seamlessly and successfully, but they also, they do a bit of like, quote unquote, good with it. They have, for example, you know, one company they won't invest in as a rule? Tesla. Walmart. Yeah, that's what I meant. Walmart. Yeah. Because they, they disagree. They don't invest in things like tobacco or um, I believe their exclusions. Where's their exclusions list? Yeah, so they've got four dozen companies that they won't invest in. Airbus, Walmart, Rio Tinto. Airbus? Is, yeah. Why? I don't know. Maybe because it has something to do with global warming. Oh, okay. For like sure. Climate change. Um, yeah, give they've me, been hit excluded. Him, give me again. Airbus, what? Walmart, Rio Tinto, which is an oil and gas operations company. Textron, which I believe is also. Damn, I am shocked that they are staying out of something. They are a, I mean, I woke mean, mind virus. Am I right? I bet we. I bet if you dig deeper, there's some nasty little things in there. Fucked up. Yeah. <sighs> so what have we learned, Emil? Probably that the financialization of everything won't stop and there's going to be new players entering every day. Uh, things, you, things you take for granted will probably be bought up and sold. The investment doesn't pan out. I It'll do still. Sp split up and sold or used as a tax loss. Cut it loose. What when does it matter? Fuck you. You want to have a street fair? Loser? You pay up. Stupid bitch. bitch. Dipshit bitch. You uh, want a bike lane? Go fuck yourself. That's going to impede with our 75-year contract, don't yeah. you know? Sorry, pal. I, I just want to take one of these guys for a ride. I want to scam one of these oil barons because they're not going to miss. I few. really would love that. I mean, truly. It, it's, It'd be like Spotify's investment into uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's podcast. Yeah, there's or thirty million dollars. There's thirty Do million dollars for nine fucking episodes. Do something. We don't care. Or what about um? Who is the one who uh the 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 girl who took J P Morgan for a ride? Oh, Charlie Javis. Yeah, Char J J Javits. I don't think it's Javits. Javits. I think that's the Javits Center. Yeah, but oh yeah, but what? Yeah, her whole thing where she just faked a bunch of numbers. Yes. and got you know yeah. I'm obsessed with Charlie Javits. Let's do that. We're obsessed with her. Teach us, Queen. Teach us from prison. We will follow your ways. Or speaking of queens in prison, Elizabeth Holmes. You could teach us a thing or two about running these guys for their money. There you go. But yeah, I mean, honestly, it makes me, when, when we're looking into this kind of stuff, it, it really makes me just, you, you know, when you're like walking around and I mean, post COVID is a perfect example of like when, I mean, LA never did it right, but a lot of cities did the outdoor spaces thing that yeah. like, we're going to take over these streets. We're going to take over these plazas, whatever. And a lot of them stayed. A lot of them went away and had like, it had people questioning where the fuck did that thing go? That yeah, thing people great. liked, where people would congregate and and be outside and and be in communal spaces. And I'm like, how much of this is because there's just, you know, look, sorry, COVID's over. We're taking our fucking money back. Okay, yeah. you guys were blocking parking meters. Yeah, I mean, we own that road. I talk about it all the time, privately, but how the city of Los Angeles loves to tax poor people in the in the form of street sweeping, street cleaning. Oh, street cleaning comes twice a week. So not only do we know that you're not going to have anywhere else to park your car, yeah. but to add insult to injury, we're not even going to clean the fucking street. The, the, the guy's just going to come by, write your car ticket. You're, you might not even see the street cleaner because it doesn't even show they up half come. the time. And when it does come, it yeah. literally, it's like, it's like someone just took some water in their mouth and just kind of went pew, 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 yeah. all over the street. And then they took these shitty metal wire brushes and just kind of sloshed it around. Great. Thanks for cleaning the street. It's a fucking useless racket. Everything's a racket. So what I take away from all this, Emil, what do you take? Not away that you asked what I think. Just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. It's uh, 
it's something that like everything it's a it's not a necessary evil but it's something that's here to stay that we can that we are powerless to to fight so we've we've just got to accept and hope that the powers that be won't fall to the same um won't succumb to the same fate as the dipshits who run chicago did and at least put in some have some have some have some smarts to make it work for us if we're going to be taking money from wait, sovereign wait, 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 wealth don't, funds don't don't end on a we just have to accept it. No, no, no. Well, we. Th- try I mean, to, try I to mean, know what's going on and make sure I mean, we don't have. We, we have to that. accept it in this, in the sense that with acceptance comes we need to be smart about setting up rules and regulations sure. to make sure that a it Chicago. Sounded very, it sounded very. Uh, just like these it. are the powers that be. We can't do anything. About no, 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 no. Yeah, no. I didn't uh, mean it like that. I think the the we the need international guidelines. Hold we people need, accountable who are trying to you know sell your fucking city for. Right. We need parts. international cooperation. America, America seems to be for sale. and uh, Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, baby, yeah. We need international cooperation. We need rules. We need regulations. We need guidelines. We need safeguards, guardrails. Okay, should we let these fine folks get back to their lives? I don't know. I think we should. If, uh, um, if you have any connections to the Saudi investment fund, please hit us up. It could, it doesn't, know. it doesn't have to just be the Saudi investment fund. We're, we're looking to talk to Abu Dhabi, China, uh, China, Kiribati. We, are, we will work with Kiribati, the island not, nation of Kiribati, n- n- not top of our list, but we're open to working with Kiribati. I do not know. Nobody knows what their the Kiribatians, um, but export. I do know they're looking to invest. Yeah, they're probably looking to invest. Imagine us, Kiribatian soccer jerseys every week. Oh, dude, I would sport that. I would wave their... We should pursue... We should try to lure them by just starting to... I don't even think they have a Twitter. I don't know if they exist anymore. They exist. <laughs> Surely Kiribati still exists. All right, folks, if you truly want more after this, you can go to PayPigs. Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash Patreon. PayPigs. Odd. We'd love to see Fucking you Fucking around in a bonus episode. If not, we... Totally understand. Yeah. We love you. Good night and God bless America.